Good morning and welcome to our worship service this morning on this Palm and Passion Sunday. As we worship, we acknowledge that the land upon which we reside is Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation. May we live with respect upon the land and in friendship and reconciliation with our neighbours. Says Palm Passion Sunday. We made some palm crosses yesterday. If you would like a palm cross, please let myself or Moshkin know, and we have someone willing to deliver those to you. In the meantime, we will have this blessing of the palms, the ones that we'll use in our worship this Sunday, and ones that will be uh, that will be delivered uh, to you if you wish. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for these palm crosses, a simple reminder of the love you showed for us. And we take them into our worship and into our homes. May they remind us through this special week that you gave your life for us upon the cross. May they remind us of how deep and wide and high is the love you have for us. As we take them into our worship, as we process and later into our homes, may we take your love into our hearts and worship you as savior and sovereign. And like the people on that first Palm Sunday, may we also cry, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. Holy and immortal God, as we enter this holy week, turn our hearts to Jerusalem so that united with Christ and all the faithful, we may enter the city not made with hands, your promised realm of justice and peace, eternal from age to age. Amen. The first reading is from Isaiah 50, verses 4 to 9a. The servant of the Lord expresses a absolute confidence in his final vindication, despite the fact that he has been struck and spit upon. This characteristic of the servant played an important role in the early church's understanding of the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Reading from Isaiah, the Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning, he wakens, wakens my ear to listen to those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face for insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint. And I know that I shall not be put to shame. He, was vindic he who vindicates me is near, who will contend with me. Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. Holy word, holy wisdom. Thanks, Thanks be to God. A reading from Psalm 31. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye is consumed with sorrow, and also my throat and my belly. For my life is wasted with grief, and my years with sighing. My strength fails me because of affliction, and my bones are consumed. I am the scorn of all my enemies, a disgrace to my neighbors, a dismay to my acquaintances. When they see me in the street, they avoid me. Like the dead, I am forgotten, out of mind. I am as useless as a broken pot. For I have heard the whispering of the crowd, fear is all around. They put their heads together against me, they plot to take my life. But as for me, I have trusted in you, O Lord. I have said, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hands of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Helper of the helpless, comfort of the afflicted, may your servants who stand in the midst of evil find strength in the knowledge of your presence and praise you for the wonders of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. A reading from Revelation. The one tree of life grows mysteriously on both sides of the river. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, 
but nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angels showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there anymore, but the throne of God and of the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and there will be no more night. They need no lamp of no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. Holy word, holy wisdom. Thanks be to God. God be with you. And also with you. The holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In fulfillment of the scripture and obedience to God's will, Jesus goes to the cross so that a new covenant in his blood may bring forgiveness of sins. Even the soldiers who crucify him recognize him to be the son of God. Now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that innocent man. For today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, let him be crucified. Then he asked, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, his blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat at him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. 
And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of, the, of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him, saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, truly, this man was God's son. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. From God, our loving parent, Jesus Christ, the tree of mystery and tree of life, and the Holy Spirit, our comfort and guide. Amen. What do you see as you look upon this icon? There is Jesus. There are the women, probably Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and a disciple. If you can look at their eyes and their facial expressions, they're so pained. Do you see how the sky is covered over? And notice that Jesus, the women and the disciple are depicted here as people of color. This icon by contemporary American artist, Kelly Lattimore is called Crucifixion. It was commissioned by Father Bill Carroll together with a piece on the resurrection. And he says, these icons remind us that God has taken the side of oppressed people everywhere and that God is still struggling for human freedom. I wanted to share it as a central image 
for today. Liturgically, scripturally, visually, there is an intended shock for us today. We begin our worship with a procession of palms, the way that the crowd celebrated and welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem. Word of Jesus' healings and miracles had spread, and he was becoming well known. The people marveled that maybe this could be the Messiah. But that rejoicing, the parade, the celebration quickly turns to a trial and execution. For the disciples, the crowds, and for us, there is a tension as the situation and mood shift so quickly. Jesus is a threat that needs to be dealt with because the Jesus movement is gaining too much momentum. Jesus knows that going to Jerusalem means his certain death, and yet he submits to undergo all that he knew would unfold. But for us, there is a shock each year as we remember and walk through Holy Week. How could the Messiah be executed? How could God allow this to happen? Why would Jesus not change the situation and save himself? The Sunday of the Passion with the Liturgy of the Palms offers us an abundance of these questions. And it feels like a bit of a roller coaster of emotions, but it is an intended shock and one that offers us a way to enter into the gospel and to begin to understand what the disciples might have been feeling too. Disillusionment, shock, denial, anger, and grief. And we see even in creation, even in the natural world, there is a response with the same grief and lament. We are told that as Jesus nears death, there is a darkness that covers the earth. And that when Jesus breathes his last, the curtain of the temple is torn in two, the earth shakes violently, rocks split in two, such a force breaking open the very cosmos so that those long dead are raised and after the resurrection are seen walking around. Such is the cosmic power and implication of Jesus dying and rising. And even now, creation groans and laments. There are other crucifixions that echo throughout creation. Theologian Nicola Torbett writes that she is convinced that the crucifixion of even a single being, whether by pesticide or plastics in the ocean, whether by state execution or inadequate health care, echoes throughout creation, that every grief registers everywhere. When any beloved creature expires, all creation shivers with it. All creation shivers with grief at the injustices, inequities, and inequalities that still exist today. We grieve with residential school survivors and those taken from their families in the 60s scoop. We lament with Indigenous peoples in Canada and throughout the world who were colonized using the doctrine of discovery as a justification for horrific atrocities. We grieve a world that does not know peace. We mourn the victims of violence. We cry out to God on behalf of those who continue to be judged marginalized, cast aside, discriminated against, their humanity questioned, especially people of color and those in the LGBTQ2 spirit community, struggling still to be seen as human beings 
in many parts of the world. As we look at this icon, which I'll ask Rebecca to put up again. As we look at this icon, we see so much. This portrayal of Jesus and his disciples with African-American features speaks the witness of the Black church to Jesus Christ's own solidarity with Black people and people of color, making clear the deep connection of Jesus' life and praxis to the Black freedom struggle, as well as to other historic movements for freedom, justice, and human dignity. Just as James H. Cohn does in his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, this icon invites us to make the deep connection between the lynching and the crucifixion of Jesus. Both are public acts of torture and murder intended to terrify and to subject other human beings and keep them in their so-called place. Even as we lament and name these truths today, we also know that this tree does not mark the end of the story. For we know that even as empire still exists and continues to justify crucifixions of all kinds, we know Jesus shatters these powers with his very life. We'll hear more about that next week. So for today, we name empire and grieve its crucifixions and executions. But we also affirm our solidarity with and genuine protest against that which seeks to destroy life and freedom, that which takes away human dignity, that which propagates injustice and fear. And that tree of despair, that tree of execution takes on new meaning for us as we see Jesus aligning with and suffering for the life of the world for you and for me. And we give thanks. Let us pray. We are grieved, O oh God, at Jesus' execution, at all that is and continues to be crucified on the tree of capitalism, greed, white supremacy, empire, and whatever seeks to destroy life, freedom, justice, and human dignity. Raise our voices and use our will to live out your gospel of life to stand in solidarity and to be effective allies with all who struggle under oppressive regimes and systemic injustice. Use us and all we are for the sake of our neighbor and the world, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Affirmation of Faith. We believe in God, whose love is the source of all life and the desire of our lives, whose love was given a human face in Jesus of Nazareth, whose love was crucified by the evil that waits to enslave us all, and whose love, defeating even death, is our glorious promise of freedom. Therefore, though we are sometimes fearful and full of doubt, in God we trust. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we commit ourselves in the service of others to seek justice and to live in peace, to care for the earth and to share the commonwealth of God's goodness to live in freedom of forgiveness and the power of the spirit of love and in the company of the faithful so to be the church for the glory of god amen 
sustained by the God's abundant mercy. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all creation. Save our churches, O God. Enable us to boldly confess in every time and place that Jesus Christ is Lord. With the humility of a servant, equip congregations, vestries, wardens, dioceses, and other ministry settings to proclaim your extravagant love for all. Merciful God. Receive our prayer. Save your creation, O God. Every living being you have made has purpose. Give us a renewed appreciation of farm animals who labor in the fields. Service animals who accompany their human companions and beloved pets who live alongside of us. Merciful God. Receive our prayer. Save the peoples of the earth, O oh God. Restore dignity to those who are scorned and persecuted for their religious beliefs or political activism and deliver them from the hand of their enemies. Bring peace to places where conflict runs deep, especially the Ukraine, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, South Sudan, Syria, and Yemen, whose conflicts are tearing families, communities, infrastructure, food systems, and entire regions apart. Merciful God. Receive our prayer. Save those who cry to you in any need, O oh God. Watch over all who are incarcerated or awaiting trial. And stand with those who are unjustly accused. Be present with those feelings, isolated, lonely, or fearful. Support victims of violence with your ever-loving presence in their time of loss and tragedy. Especially those affected at the Covenant Church Elementary School in Nashville. Grant healing and comfort to all who are sick or in any need. Especially, we pray for Doug Andrews, Eduardo Ansaldo, Chris Atkins, Catherine Ash, Shirley Burns, Doreen Holland, Annika and Betty Matthias, Mary Mackay, John Moore, Linda Hopkin, Dion Chirazi, Edna Vibert, Karen Wright, and Gail Sink. Merciful God. Receive our prayer. Save us in your love, O oh God. Guide the work of church musicians, priests, pastors, choirs, readers, deacons, technicians, lay assistants, and all who assist in worship. Sustain them in their leadership as they accompany congregations throughout this holy week. Merciful God. Receive our prayer. Save us at last, O God. We give you thanks for your saints of old who embodied your servant love. As you came to their aid, so deliver us in times of trial that every knee would bend in praise to you. We remember those who have gone before us, those taken too soon, whom we love and remember, especially Steve Wormuth. Surround his family with your love, grace, and peace. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. 
gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us pray as our Savior taught us. Our God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil for the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And the whole earth live to praise your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Receive the blessing of our God. God, the giver of love, Christ, the resurrection and the life, and the Holy Spirit of rebirth, bless you in this Lenten journey and through this holy week and always. Amen. Go in peace. Follow the way of Jesus. Thanks be to God.